Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about stuff that is classical. It's in the title. It's pretty straightforward. My name is Thomas Magby. I am joined as always by Mr. Graham Donaldson. Hi. And Mr. A.J. Hannenberg. This guy. And as a matter of fact, this guy will be leaving our discussion today of a certain doctor. We're going to be talking about the medical field today. We're going to talk about leeches and bleeding and all kinds of fun stuff. All of that is wrong, but you're close. What? (laughs) So close. So today, I... Do you guys know, like, I, I imagine because you're educated men that you know what, f- who Faust is. Sure. Um, He's like a doctor. Sells a soul to his devil. To the devil. Yeah. So you guys actually know things. And whenever I heard the name <laughs> Faust, uh, it was entangled weirdly with the name Proust. And I mm. thought he was some Interesting. inaccessible author that mm. I would probably never read and that people did their doctorates upon. And so somebody would say that something was Faustian and I had no idea what that mm. means. That's and funny. there was no purchase in my mind for what that was. So there are, there are a few, a few things that to me are like academic unicorns. Mm. Uh, one one of them is Faust. Mm-hmm. One of them is Proust. Mm. And one is Ulysses by what's his name? James Joyce. James Joyce. So Joyce is the other one that I'm Mm. like, someday I will climb into James Joyce and figure it out. But today is my first jump into Faust. Different than Feist. Different than Feist. Feist's music is great. One, two, three, four. Um, What's the next one? One, two, three, four, something on the door. Yeah, I I can't remember it. Um, Anyway. I don't understand how you two have the same cultural education. Like whenever there's a reference, the other one immediately picks it up. I don't understand this. Do you all listen to all of your music together? No. Okay. No. We're just hip. We're just, <laughs> if only I could be hip. Okay, cool. But you're younger than us. You know that someone's cultural not. education is like, I don't know, it should be or something. <laughs> you well, know someone's about. not hip when they say hip. Uh, like it's a, it's a, a, yes. It is a litmus test to being absolutely n- uncool. Okay. You guys are pretty groovy. <laughs> <laughs> Far out, man. <laughs> <laughs> These beats are pretty crunchy. Okay, uh, so thing? I I looked into Faust, and it turns out that hey, it's a play by a guy named Christopher Marlowe, and mm-hmm. it comes I think from like German folklore way back when. And it actually there's two different Faust plays, and this is what really confused me when I started looking into it is there's Doctor Faustus by Christopher Marlowe, and then Faust by Goethe is how you pronounce Goethe. it. Right? Goethe. I always want to say mm-hmm. goat. Goat. Uh, yes. But we'll talk about Goat's play Goat, next time. Goathy. <laughs> Goathy. Yeah. Goathy. So we'll talk about Goethe's play next time. This is going to be a three-part series. So I'll do Marlowe's Faust in this one, or Dr. Faustus, and then Fa- <clears throat> the Faust of Goethe in the next two. Cool. So today is Faust number one, Dr. Faustus, written by Christopher Marlowe, it probably around the year 1590, and then published in 1604. And this was after, I believe, after his death. Okay. So this is when it was published. It came out post-mortem and... So Shakespeare contemporary. He was a Shakespeare contemporary. And at the time, Pride of Place actually belonged to Marlowe. He was the famous one. when Because oh. uh, Shakespeare hadn't really written that much at the at the time, and Marlowe had. And mm. so Marlowe was a lot more famous than Shakespeare was. Shakespeare would eventually eclipse him. And I think rightfully so. The level a- After reading this book, I got to say that the level of artistry in Shakespeare is far superior. Hmm. Marlowe was a hack compared to Shakespeare. <laughs> wow. uh, weirdly enough, there are actually two different texts of Dr. Faustus. There's text A, which came out and was largely put together from his notes. And then there's text B, which probably had a couple other authors contributing and is about 600 lines longer. I think 600. Yeah. Is it better? Is that the one you're reading from? Um, I am reading text A because it seems more legitimate to me, you know, without extra additional by other playwrights sure. i wanted to read the straight dope as it were so uh-huh. <laughs> so i'm but maybe those uh, those 600 lines are the best ones in the play yeah but they're not by christopher marlowe this is fair and, and so i i read or they may be not by christopher marlowe i don't really know there's a lot of mystery about who wrote what and when and where so i'm just going to go with text a and call it good and then i'll be doing the faust by goethe next time which is from what i've read of it so far just far superior. Mm. It's a way better play. It's more fun to read. It's in more interesting meter. It's originally in German, but even the, the choice of scene and setting and the, the plot and how it progresses is way better than what Christopher Marlowe has put together. And I know that that's not, you're not selling this podcast. Yeah. I was going to say, I know this isn't like a glowing, like you should keep listening, but I promise, I promise you it is interesting. Even if the, the artistry gotcha. of the play is pretty trash. So if you are wondering is about it, pretty it, trash or just not as good as Shakespeare. Cause those are mm, different. Those metrics. Are different. Yeah. It's not as good as Shakespeare. I would put it as like lower mid level. Mm. It's okay. Okay. 
How many levels are there? Yeah. Now I'm thinking about the ranking system. I, I would rank it a four on the artistry uh, level. It's it's, it's above uh, what is what is the vampire one? The series, the Dracula. sparkly uh, vampires. Oh, Twilight. Twilight. I'd put it above Twilight, but okay. I'd put it below Star Trek: Next Generation. Mm, mm. Okay, that's fair. I accept this ranking system. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So, but the thing is, is like, so you can listen to the podcast, get the plot of this one, generally ignore the play if you want, <laughs> hear about what's happening, and then go and read the Goethe version, which is next time. But oh. this lays kind of the fun little groundwork because Goethe comes 200 years later. And the okay. stories are pretty similar? The stories are fairly similar from yep. what I gather. There's a lot more detail and extra stuff in Goethe that isn't in Marlowe, but that's fine. Okay. It's okay. Cool. So I'm going to go over the plot really fast and then we will sort of develop some stuff past plot that we can chat about. Um, so scene one, we are introduced to Dr. Faustus who turns out is a professor of divinity, right? He studies theology, but he fakes it. He's, mm. he's not a divine. He doesn't really believe in God. He is, he's one of those academics who's gotten to the end of academia and is like, this is worth nothing. Mm. And so there's a, a scene in which he is sort of like picking up random books and saying, well, pff, that's trash. <laughs> pff, that's trash. And he kind of picks up each theory and says it's garbage. Um, so we meet him sort of in his study as he is doing this. And when he picks up the Bible, he says, uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and there's no truth in us. He's kind of reading and, mm -hmm. and, and summarizing. Why then, belike, we must sin and so consequently die. Aye, we must die an everlasting death. Why doctrine call you this? She sera sera, what will be, what will, will be. Divinity, adieu. So he's like, we, ha we are gonna sin and if we sin, we die. So <laughs> screw it, and that's I'm it. out. And that's like, he, he dismisses the Bible offhand. And so we see kind of a, pride in this Dr. Faustus fella. He thinks he's all that. He thinks he's got all these guys figured out and he sort of has them all nailed to the wall. And he's like, well, I'm done with it. He picks up Justinian and dishes Dis Justinian. He oh. picks up like Aristotle and he's like, Aristotle sucks. And he kind of does that to everybody. And he's like, what I want is something that can explain the mysteries of the world to me. Right. And I, I would love, um, like Weston. <gasps> yeah. It's all connected. Yeah, I want to be a magician. Right. Like he's like, I want, I want the magic. I want control. I want power. I want wealth. I want all these things because academia just ain't cracking it for me. Um, and then, and what academic hasn't had that thought <laughs> at some point? Yeah, I mean, like he's come to the end of knowledge, but he has not right. found faith. Gotcha. Right. Mm. And and he's disgusted with it. And he's like, this just isn't cutting it. And so. At right then, a good angel and an evil angel walk in. And oh, so wow. we have our Literally, Weston and right. our Ransom. Right. Like, we have the, the two shoulder sitters. Right. And, and they, they basically says, they're like, hey, they tempt him one way or the other way. And then he eventually basically says, uh, I want magic. I'm going to do it. What do they, what do they offer? Uh, let's see. This first instance, the good, angels, good angel offer, like, just keep so going. So he has, he has picked up a book of magic and he's uh -huh. like ah this is what i'm looking for this is what he says he says these metaphysics of magicians and necromantic books are heavenly lines circles scenes <laughs> letters characters i the, these are those that faustus most desires oh what a world of profit and delight power honor omnipotence is promised to the studious artisan all things that move between the quiet poles shall be at my command like he's like i want to be a wizard <laughs> and then the good angel comes in and says, Oh, Faustus, lay that damned book aside and gaze not on it, lest it tempt thy soul and heap God's heavy wrath upon thy head. Read, read the scriptures. That is blasphemy. The evil angel says, Go forward, Faustus, in right. that famous art wherein all nature's treasury is contained. So it promises him nature, right? Right. It's like kind of a humanism thing. And the good angel promises the Bible, right? And yeah. And he says, be thou on earth as Jove is in the sky, Lord and commander of these elements. He's yeah. like, you get to command the world. Do that. And then... They bail. The angels go away. The good angels like read the Bible, and the evil angels like get wizard powers, and then they leave. And that's it. That's the whole conversation. <laughs> okay. And so uh, Faustus decides on the wizardy, and he brings in his two buddies that he knows are magicians, and he's like, "Boys, we're doing it. I'm going to gather together all the texts I know and go to the forest and see if I can't conjure me a spirit." And so they're like, "Okay, sweet. Wait, really? Yeah, it's messed up." So he gets all all of these like wizardy books, and then uh, they go and conjure and i'm not gonna read the latin with which he conjures because a lot of it is like down with god i hate the scriptures come to me 
devils. And as we learned in the last uh, podcast, yeah. saying that sort of thing, you be maybe careful. not a great idea. Not a great idea. So Don't I'm going to go ahead and not say it. He says it in Latin. And then bloop, this character <laughs> pops out and his name is Mephistopheles. Oh, okay. have you guys heard of the name before? Mm-hmm. Yes. This is where it originates. Oh, this is the wow. first appearance of Mephistopheles is in, I think he was maybe a character of German folklore beforehand, but connected directly with Faust. And this is the huh. first appearance in literature. Wow. So Mephistopheles pops up. Isn't like one of the that name of one of the cats and cats? Probably. I think so. Yes. And so he shows up and he's like this evil, spooky demon, and Faust is like, ah! There, you're freaking me out. Go change that shape. Come back as like a friar or something. So Mephistopheles is like, all right. So he walks out and then comes back in as a priest. And he's like, hi, I'm still the same guy. And he's like, ah, phew. And he says, did I conjure you? And Mephistopheles is like, no, like you don't have any power. I came because you cursed God. And I, I basically smelled a soul that was wow. ripe for the harvest. Uh. And he's like, whenever somebody curses God in the scriptures, we just pop up because like, hey, free soul yeah. and, and oh that's gosh. what he says and he's like i i charge the uh mephistopheles says now faustus what wouldst thou have me do um and Mephisto- and faustus says i charge thee wait upon me whilst i live to do whatever faustus shall command be it make the moon drop from her sphere or the ocean to overwhelm the world mephistopheles says i am a servant of great lucifer and may not follow thee without his leave no more than he commands must we perform faustus says did he charge thee to appear to me? Mephistopheles is like, nope, I came hither of my own accord. And he says, do my conjuring speeches raise thee? Speak. And he's like, not, not really. And then uh, Mephistopheles eventually asks him, are you damned? And he's like, yeah, totally in hell. And he's like, but you're here on earth. And he's right. like, yeah, it's hell. I'm, I'm a separate from God. Call this hell. This is fine. And um, Faustus says, all right, I'm going to make a deal. And this is what he tells Mephistopheles. He says, go bear those tidings to great Lucifer. Seeing Faustus hath incurred eternal death by desperate thoughts against Jove's deity. Say he surrenders up to him his soul. So he will spare him four and 20 years, letting him live in all voluptuousness, having thee ever to attend on me to give me whatsoever I ask, to tell me whatsoever I demand, to slay mine enemies and aid my friends and always be obedient to my will. Go and return to mighty Lucifer and meet me in my study at midnight and then resolve me of thy master's mind. So basically, I got a deal for you. 24 years, I got all wizardy powers and you have to help me out. And then Lucifer gets my soul. And Mephistopheles is like, seems like a bad deal. Um, I don't know why he picked 24 years. Yeah, Say right. 50. Like this is coming from Faustus's mouth, not Mephistopheles. Right. Yeah. He's like, this is the deal I've cooked up. And get a longer term limit or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah seriously. Like you, you gotta, can't refinance that. You gotta yeah, exactly. wait a little <laughs> bit. What yeah. you gotta say is, I offer my soul in return for power. Yeah. What terms would Lucifer put forward? And then you gotta you gotta bargain a little. That's right, right. Back and forth. Yeah. The the worst alarm is that Lucifer takes this deal the, straight the away. Offer. That's right. That, yeah. Like never. If they yeah. take the first offer, you're doing a Way bad job. Low. That's right. Mm-hmm. So Mephisto Meph goes and comes back and he's like, "Yes, it's a deal." Um, so there are all the, all these little asides with like funny characters, Robin and Wagner. I'm not going to talk about them. You can go and read the book if you want to. They're just like comedic asides where some, some lowly people get a hold of, of Faustus's magic book and start trying to do wizardy spells where they can like hang out with ladies and do body things. And I'm not going to go there. Does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. I mean, I think they end up turning each other into weird creatures and like stealing silver and all kinds of stuff. It's not great. Um, you seem, so, to, you seem to really love this book. I, it's just like, <laughs> it seems to serve no other purpose than just body comedic relief. Sure. Like they talk about, I want to change my shape so I can like go anywhere on a woman that I please. I'll be a flea. And it's just, it's just like gross and right. kind of tasteless yeah. and it's not, it's not awesome. Yeah. Uh, so you gonna get squished if you're a fly. Yeah. That'd be a problem. Yeah. Can I also say that the cat's name is Mr. Mistopheles? I just want to make sure we corrected that one. M- Mr. Mistopheles? Mr. Mistopheles. That's so not Mephistopheles. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That was a classical thing. We got wrong. I'm very sorry about that. T.S. Eliot did T.S. Eliot did that. That's exactly right. <laughs> so Meph- Mephistopheles comes back and Faustus asks, what, what, is, what does Lucifer say? And he says that I will wait on Faustus while I live. So he will buy my service with his soul. Like it, it's a deal. And Faustus says, already Faustus hath hazarded that for thee. Mephistopheles. 
But, Faustus, thou must bequeath it solemnly and write a deed of gift with thine own blood, for that security craves great Lucifer. If thou deny it, I will go back to hell. He's like, look, we're not going to do it without it. You got to write it down. You got to write it down in your own blood or I'm not going to like, we got to make this deal fast. It's funny that the devil wants that security, right? Exactly. Um, And Faustus is like, okay, why does, what good will my soul do the devil? What's the point? Like, what does he want it for? And he's like, to enlarge his kingdom. (laughs) And Faustus is like, that's, that's what it is. And he's like, yeah, misery wants company. (laughs) That's pretty much it. He wants dudes to be in pain with him okay and that's that's it and so he says like he ends up stabbing his arm and and beginning the thing and here are the conditions of mm. faustus's trade he like r- like does these all on these Does conditions he a little lightheaded as it goes along <laughs> right. follow well <laughs> I'll, I'll get there on these conditions following first that faustus may be a spirit in form and substance secondly that mephistopheles shall be his servant and at his command Thirdly, that Mephistopheles shall do for him and bring him whatsoever. Fourthly, that I should be in his chamber or house invisible. Lastly, that he shall appear to the said John Faustus at all times in what form or shape soever he please. I, John Faustus of Wittenberg, doctor, by these presents do give both body and soul to Lucifer, prince of the East, and his minister Mephistopheles, and therefore, and furthermore, grant unto them that 24 years being expired, the articles above written in violet, full power to fetch or carry the said John Faustus' body and soul, flesh and blood, or goods into their habitation where, wheresoever by me, John Faustus. And all in blood. I, I don't know if all of that oh, was in blood. Okay. I sure Let me hope see. not. Let me see the scroll. I feel like it would be a short play. I think it is all. in blood because okay. well. he, he, he like does it and then he starts to write the bill and once he like he's been writing so long the blood kind of stops flowing he's like ah flip and so he has to recut it oh my gosh and then do it again and at one point written on his arm comes up the words homo fugue which means man run and he's mm. like that's weird I'm like <laughs> nah nothing's wrong he's about like that. no yeah. no it's there it's yeah. up here on my like the the angels are like dude you got to get out of there and he yeah. doesn't he writes it and then the devil says like we're going to we're going to burn it and that's going to be the significance of of like the the, the deal made right. right and so the first thing he does once he's d- he's done is he questions if it's like questions him about hell and then um he he thinks hell is just an old wives tale and mephistopheles is like dude i'm right here i live in hell right like it's a real thing i've been there and Faustus is like, well, if earth is hell, then I'll sure be damned here. That's fine. Now get me a wife. And Mephistopheles is like, uh, I don't want to. And he's like, I said, do it. What? So he goes and he gets a devil woman and brings a devil dressed up as a woman. And like, it's clearly a devil and he's with fireworks. I guess there, there's fireworks that are supposed to happen on stage. Uh And he's like, uh, get it, get her out of here. And Mephistopheles is like, look, man, I'll just get you lots, lots of ladies. How about a bunch of hot ladies? No, no, like wife. We'll call it good. And he's like, is right, he not fine. allowed to? Because it's a sacred bond. Is that why he can't do? it? I don't know. I don't know oh. why he's uncomfortable with the thought of marriage. Uh, maybe it is because it's a sacred bond and he can't pull that off. Maybe, right? or maybe he can't. Like, yeah, force this poor woman to marry a damned soul. Right. Hmm. Yeah. And then he gives Faustus a book, and the book can conjure armies. Hmm. Uh, oh. conj- like bring about weather, conjure spirits, know spells, know the character of the planets in the heavens, see all plants and herbs and trees. And, like it's all there in that book. And Faustus keeps going, wait, 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 but does it have spells in it? And he's like, yeah, flip a few pages. It's right there. And he's like, oh, well, uh, what about like plants and trees and stuff? And he's like, oh, it's over here. You know, uh-huh. It's right there. It's like, cool. <laughs> awesome. And that's, and that's the book that eventually gets into the hands of like the stable boy. And then they start doing spells and stuff with it. Got it. Um, which is also like, if you, if you remember our old episode about the spheres, that that information kind of pops up here. He starts to question Mephistopheles about the nature of the heavens. And he's like, ah, so tell me about him. He's like, well, there's a bunch of spheres and each one has its intelligence and they rotate on all the same direction. He's like, I knew that. And he's like, yeah, it's, it's what it is. <laughs> and, and, and so, um, then weirdly enough, let's see. He, he says, let me for a, let's see, hold on one sec. Oh, eventually he asks who made the world and Mephistopheles won't answer. Mm. He says, I'm not going to talk about that. We don't talk about God here. Faust considers repentance and the good and evil angels show up. And then Mephistopheles comes back with Lucifer and Beelzebub. And he's like, Hey, 
stop the repentance business. Knock it off. You promised Christ cannot save your soul for he is just and you have denounced him. Like this is the argument they use is that Christ will be just to you and that justice is the damnation of your soul because you have renounced him. And and Faustus is, he always gets kind of freaked out when Lucifer comes around. He's like, huh, uh, j- pardon me of that one thing. And I, I swear I'll like burn churches and kill ministers oh and stuff. Gosh. And they're like, all right, sure. And so to pass the time, and I don't know why this is in here, they bring forward the seven deadly sins <sighs> in like corporeal form. They're like, let me introduce you to them. Just and so they talk. trot out these demons uh-huh. that are supposed to be the sins, and they talk about the seven deadly sins. I don't know why this is in the story. It doesn't seem to have any effect on the plot. This is why I question the artistry. It seems yeah. like just a weird pastime. If you'd like to hear a short paragraph by any of the seven deadly sins, why, by all means, do you have one you'd want to hear? Hmm. Sloth? Yeah. Let's... Okay. Pride, covetousness. Sloth is actually a fun one. He says, yes. I am sloth. I was begotten on a sunny bank where I have lain ever since. (laughs) And you have done me great injury to bring me from thence. Let me be carried thither again by gluttony and lechery. I'll not speak another word for a king's ransom. Okay. And that's it. That's that's all that he says. Any any, any others you'd like to hear? Um, Wrath. Wrath. Okay, let's do wrath. I like that he's like, I was born on a sunny bank and I stayed there forever. And I'm I'm freaking dragged me here and I want to go back. Cheesed off. Okay, wrath. I am a wrath. I had neither father nor mother. I leapt out of a lion's mouth when I was scarce half an hour old, and ever since I have run up and down the world with this case of rapiers, wounding myself when I had nobody to fight with all. I was born in hell, and look to it, for some of you shall be my father. Hmm. Wow. Cool. Is this so Lucifer is introducing these demons or they Yeah, just they're just up? hanging out in his study like <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just this weird <laughs> like entertainment show. He's like we're just going to pass the time by introducing the sins. And I, I don't know maybe it's that at the end of it Faustus says, "I embrace them all and they make oh. me happy." Oh. That it's supposed to show that he sort of embraces the deadly sins. Oh, okay. Right. But the artistry is kind of lacking. Mm. Right? It seems like just an excuse like to a, bring them out. It's like educational, right? You're you're teaching your audience. Here are the seven deadly sins, and here's some things yeah, about them. Yeah, it's like an after-school special, for right? Like kids. <laughs> yeah. This is the PSA portion yeah, of yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. I'm trying here. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so then, <laughs> so he, they, like, uh, he gets stoked about the sins. Eventually, he asks to see hell and come back. And Lucifer's like, "All right, meet me at midnight." And so they go. Uh, I mean, like, it's implied that he gets to go and see what hell is all mm-hmm. about. Um, and then afterwards, it's sort of like a time passes thing. And he starts to travel with Mephistopheles and eventually he ends up in Rome and they've been through Paris and they've been through chunks of Italy. And now they're at Rome and Faust really wants to see all the monuments. He's like, I want to go see all this cool stuff that's in Rome. Mm-hmm. Mephistopheles is like, okay, better idea. How about we go screw with the Pope and his priests? Oh Cause gosh. his priests are all about like drinking and eating food. And he's like, Okay, so they get invisible and they go into the presence of the Pope who is trying to eat food that was sent by the Bishop of Milan, like a nice little dish or delicacy. Right. And they keep on talking and it freaks the Pope out. Like, he's like, what's happening? Um, So the Pope's like, how now? Who's that who spake? Friars, look about. And the Friars like, "Uh, nobody's here except the Pope. Right. And the Pope's like, okay, here is a dainty dish sent to me from the Bishop of Milan. He's about to eat. And then Faustus like, takes the food from him and he's like, I thank you, sir. I kid you not. That's the words. I thank you, sir. And then the Pope is like, Whoa, who's that who snatched the meat from me? Will no man look my Lord. This dish was sent me from the Cardinal floor. So he tries to eat more food. And Faustus is like, I'll have it. And like snoikes the food. And so he just kind of plays pranks and he smacks one of the, the Cardinals on, on the head and like boxes the Pope about the ears. And then all of them start praying and they're like, be gone with this spirit. And then eventually they just sort of leave. And Mephistopheles is like, ah, we got cursed. That's kind of a bummer. Mm. And then that's it. <laughs> that's what he does in Rome. That's like the extent of his of what he does power. Yeah. That's, that's kind of it. And then he eventually grows and grows and grows in fame and gets to be known by the Holy Roman emperor, right? For what? Uh, just for like, knowledge and oh. proof of conjury. Like okay. he knows all kinds of things. He's really wise and he can do like cool magic tricks. Okay. And so the emperor brings him up and says, I would like to see like as a test of your stuff, mm. I would like to see Alexander, the great Alexander, the great and his, his, his woman 
like before me. I want to see what they looked like. I, I, I've always admired him and I just want to see him. And can you do that? And he's like, well, kind of. I can't get them specifically, but I can get spirits that look like them when they were alive. And this nearby night is like, this guy's a joke. And and <laughs> can't bring Alexander the King. Yeah, exactly. And Faustus <laughs> hears him in the night's like, ah, I got no time for conjure like conjurers tricks. This guy's an idiot. And so the, the night kind of bails. Faustus orders Mephistopheles to bring the spirits, and the spirits come up and they look like the Alexander the Great and his right. woman. And everyone's like, Yay, great, good job. <laughs> and then he brings the knight back and he's um, given the knight horns like a stag, and he's like, Ah, See, I gotcha. I'm a wizard. And then the knight's like, take him off, man. Yeah. And he's like, all right. <laughs> and then he does. And that's that scene. He Great. does. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> uh, so the, that's that's the scene. And then eventually he's sort of like time is winding down towards his 24, oh, right. his 24 year thing. And right. he's starting to like, he's sort of on his homeward journey walking home. And he decides he wants to walk rather than ride, ride a horse. So he sells his horse to a horse dealer. Mm-hmm. And he says, look, man, I'll sell you the horse. Sell him on the cheaps, 40 bucks, but don't ride him through water. Don't do it. Don't you ride him through water. And the, the horse course is like, all right, it's a weird rule, but I guess. And so eventually he comes, he pops on this mm-hmm. horse and he rides to a stream and he thinks, what, what's the horse going to do? Like lead me weird down the stream or drown or something. It's really shallow. I'll be mm-hmm. fine. So he rides it in and poof, turns out the horse was a bale of hay. <laughs> mm. And, so changes back. and so he's like, oh, dang it. So he goes back to Faust. He's like, I want my 40 bucks back. But Mephistopheles is like, look, man, he's sleeping. You can't see him right now. And he's like, I'll see him right now. My horse is hay. And he's like, you can't see him. He hasn't slept for like eight weeks. And the guy's like, I'll see him right now. So he walks up to the sleeping Faustus uh-huh. and yanks on his leg to try to wake him up. And the leg pops off. What? And he's like, ah, ah, ah. And then Faustus wakes and he's like, my leg, my leg, you have my, leg. you'll pay me like more for this. And the guy's like, I'll give you back your $40. I'll give you $40. Uh, whatever you want. Just don't make this a big deal. And he's like, sounds fine. Go get 40 bucks. And so the horse courser runs off. And of course it was a trick. He right. has both legs right. and the horse courser is going to give him another $40 for jerk. the trick. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. I mean, he sold his soul to the devil. So yeah, not exactly a great character. And then one of the last there's there's like two more scenes these where are lame these. tricks to have like if you, you sell your soul to the devil I wouldn't want you know I don't know you can pop so your that's, leg off. that's a walk home that's <laughs> part of it like he he really sort of wastes the power yeah uh, right. we'll get there in a second okay. there's two more tricks he does and then we can kind of do the final All big right. finale um, so then he kind of hangs out with a duke and his pregnant wife and the pregnant wife is like man I'd really love some grapes they're out of season. We got no grapes around here, but I'm pregnant and I have a craving and I want grapes. And so he's like, Mephistopheles, do grapes. And so Mephistopheles like blips into a place where they're in season, grabs the grapes, brings them back. And the woman's like, these are delicious grapes. And that's the end of that. <laughs> that's the story. Great. And then okay. at the very end, when he's back home, he's with his scholars that he sort of grew up with. And they're having sort of an end, of, you know, a big party. Right. They all want to see Helen. And he's like, well, I conjure Helen. Of there Troy? she is. And everyone's like, oh, dang, she hot. And he's like, yes, she is well done and then he kind of since time is winding down he sort of freaks out and he's like man maybe i should repent and mephistopheles is like stop it i heard no more repenting and he's like oh okay cool uh if you bring me helen as a lover i'll 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 not repent anymore and mephistopheles is like fine so he brings helen they smooch some and then they sort of leave and that sort of stops him from his repenting at that moment so I'm going to read sort of the ending. And this is, I mean, it's actually a really pretty short play. It's only about 40 or 50 pages. Yeah, looking at the book you're holding, there's still uh, three quarters of the book left behind it. Is that all commentary? Yeah. Well, it's the B text. Okay. And then commentary. Okay. But most, I mean, most of this is commentary. The commentary starts here. Okay. So right. It's, yeah. So half, it's like half, an, over half the yeah, book yeah, is exactly. just commentary. So it's actually a pretty short read. It feels like I'm glossing over a ton and I'm really not. There's not a whole lot of detail to gloss over. Sure. So... Page 51, and it is it is moments before Faustus is about to be called to hell by the devil. He's got an hour left. Right. And so I'm going to read his sort of his ending speech and then the epilogue. And then there are developments that we'll talk about. All right. So his ending speech. Ah, Faustus, now hast thou but one bare hour to live, and then thou must be damned perpetually. Stand still, you ever moving spears of heaven, that time may cease and midnight never come. Fair nature's eyes rise Rise again and make perpetual day, or let this hour be a year, a month, a week, a natural day that Faustus may repent and save his soul. And he says some Latin, which means, oh, run slowly, slowly, you horses of night. 
O lente lente curate noctis equi. Night horse. <laughs> the stars move still. Time runs. The clock will strike. The devil will come and Faustus must be damned. Oh, I'll leap up to my God. Who pulls me down? See, see where Christ's blood streams in the firmament. How oh, one drop would save my soul. Half a drop. Ah, my Christ. Ah, rend not my heart for naming of my Christ. Yet will I call on him. Oh, spare me, Lucifer. Where is it now? Tis gone. And see where God stretcheth out his arm and bends his ireful brows. Mountains and hills, come, come and fall on me and hide me from the heavy wrath of God. No, no, then will I headlong run into the earth. Earth, gape, oh no, it will not harbor me. You stars that reigned at my nativity, whose influence hath allotted death and hell, now draw up Faustus like a foggy mist into the entrails of yon laboring cloud, that when you vomit forth into the air, my limbs may issue from your smoky mouths so that my soul may but ascend to heaven. So he's just like anywhere I can hide. Right. Hills cover me. Nope. But then I'll like, I'll sink into hell. Uh, maybe I can become a cloud or maybe I like, maybe day will be perpetual. He's just, he's freaking out. Trying for anything. Right? Okay. The watch strikes. Half an hour has passed. Ah, half the hour has passed. Twill all be past anon. Oh God, if thou will not have mercy on my soul, yet for Christ's sake, whose blood hath ransomed me, impose some end to my incessant pain. Let Faustus live in hell a thousand years, a hundred thousand, and at last be saved. No, no end is limited to damned souls. Why wert thou not a creature wanting a soul? Or why is this immortal that thou hast? So he's, he's like, I wish I could go to hell with a promise of some sort of reprieve after a time. Like a right. million years, as long as I still have a reprieve, but there's none. I wish maybe I was a squirrel who doesn't have a soul, but alas, I've got one. Um, ah, Pythagoras is metaphys- metis- Metempsychosis. Were that true, this soul should fly for me and I be changed into some brutish beasts. All beasts are happy, for when they die, their souls are soon dissolved in elements, but mine must live still to be plagued in hell. Cursed be the parents that engendered me. No, Faustus, curse thyself, right. curse Lucifer that hath deprived thee of the joys of heaven. The clock strikes twelve. Oh, it strikes, it strikes. Now, body, turn to air, or Lucifer will bear thee quick to hell. He's like, I wish I could just poof. Thunder and lightning. <laughs> O soul be changed into little water drops and fall into the ocean, ne'er to be found. Enter devils. Right. My God, my God, look not so fierce on me. Adders and serpents, let me breathe a while. Ugly hell, gape not. Come not, Lucifer. I'll burn my books. Ah, Mephistopheles. And then the devils drag him off. Right. That's the end. Right. So he's just having general freak out till the devils sort of carry him to hell. And here's the epilogue. The chorus walks in and they say, cut is the branch that might have grown full straight. And burned is Apollo's laurel bough that sometime grew within this learned man. Faustus is gone. Regard his hellish fall, whose fiendful fortune may exhort the wise only to wonder at unlawful things, whose deepness doth entice such forward wits to practice more than heavenly power permits. So basically, don't do magic. Right. Don't. You naughty. Don't, like, pay attention. Don't sell your soul to the devil. Okay. That, that's a good moral. It's a good moral. Sure. So... There are, there are things that sort of might, uh, f- so first let's, let's chat about, yes. Animals don't have souls? Uh, according to some things. <laughs> that's, but they do worship, so don't worry about it. That's fine. I've been alerted that we're only halfway through the episode. That's okay. Much of the content of this episode is after the plot. Great. Okay. So first, yeah, he sort of sold his soul for like getting grapes and stealing dishes from the Pope and turning his horse into a hay bale and like he, he wasted his I mean, power cool stuff <laughs> wait wait but he smooched helen yeah i mean yeah. that's something that's, not all of us can say that's you know that's pretty that's yeah they're not bad stuff they're kind of cool but wait, what but he thought he would gain this like omnipotent power over the world and what he did was traipse around with yeah, a he devil that, that could, like tell him how to do storms and stuff and, right. but he didn't actually have the power most of what he did was mephistopheles do a thing and mephistopheles would do a thing and mm-hmm. so he didn't actually get the power he wanted oh but he had control over Mephistopheles for those 24 years. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like, he could have done so much more and yes. he ended sort of, he ended up sort of frittering, frittering away his power with cheap tricks and conjurers baubles, like stuff that you might see at a really bad magician show. Right. And that was it. It seems kind of lame, right? That he could have done, he could have done anything and he chose just to traipse around the world. Yeah. Okay. Or that's all you do get. In that kind of deal. That it couldn't have been any other way? Yeah, there is no power. You know, there is no, like, you don't get, I don't know, like, what, 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 what could he have done? 
become emperor of Rome instead of trying to impress the emperor of Rome? I Take guess. over the world. Um, but I guess it, he could have done that. He some, could have conjured armies. He yes. could have had all the ladies instead of just one dead Helen at the very end, like the night before he died. Right. Yeah, I guess. But he just wasn't that creative. Yes, that. I was going to say, like, what you would want him to do is advance, like, human knowledge in some significant way. If he has access to everything, then advance medicine. But he's corrupted. He's not going to do something good for the world, right? And that's the funny thing. The first thing he did was interview Mephistopheles. He's like, tell me about the universe. And Mephistopheles is like, it's exactly what every boy already knows. And he's like, oh, Cool. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's the, the secret knowledge that he gets is right. the stuff that everyone has taught since boyhood, right. right? Well, that's the thing is like the the forbidden thing seems enticing and then when you have it, it's like, oh, this is what people told me about it. It actually kind of sucks and they were right. And it's not as great as I thought it was. Right. Yeah, it's just not as cool. So how does Mephistopheles feel towards Faust Faustus during the, the play? Is he like cheesed off and annoyed and like does he roll his eyes to the audience when he's like go get me grapes is Mephistopheles like oh gosh just two more years <laughs> Mephistopheles <laughs> actually seems like pretty okay with things okay. I mean 24 years isn't much to a devil that lives a gajillion and Faust seems like an okay guy to hang out with mm-hmm. and they, they seem to have some fun stealing food from the Pope but <laughs> uh, beyond that it's it's like not that much of a bummer for him it seems yeah. he, he seems like a honestly the tragic character seems to me like Faust seems like a fool. The tragedy mm-hmm. is Mephistopheles mm-hmm. who has been condemned to hell and is, has to follow this kind of foolish dude around because he wants the soul because he wants company and misery. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. That the, it's supposed to be sort of the tragedy of Dr. Faustus, but to me it seems almost the tragedy of a fallen I'm just, angel. I just got like a, a Sancho man of La Mancha kind of vibe. Yes. Oh yeah. The fool. And then this sort of like the guy that's sort of following him around and is catering to him kind of but is smarter than him but is smarter than him could run the show but yeah. he's just not um he just didn't he, he wasn't born into the right position essentially right mephistopheles is a spiritual creature as he's opposed got to human power, yeah. yeah like he, he could do more okay to add extra complications to this okay i'm going to read you a letter sent by a guy named Richard Baines, who was a member of the Middle Temple and worked as some kind of government informer and spy about Marlowe's heretical beliefs. Oh, this is about Christopher Marlowe. So this is about the the author, author, Christopher Marlowe, sent by a guy in around 1593, which I think was the year of Marlowe's death. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So let me really quick read you this letter and then tell you a little bit about who Thomas Marlowe was, and then I think it'll bring new color to the entire play. So here's the letter. A note containing the opinion of one Christopher Marley concerning his damnable damnable judgment of religion and scorn of God's word. Okay. And there's like a few different things that he believes about God. Actually, it's a pretty long, long letter, so I might just read a few and you'll kind of get the idea. That the Indians and many authors of antiquity have assuredly written of above 16,000 years gone, where Adam is proved to have lived within 6,000 years. He affirms that Moses was but a juggler and that one Harriot's being Sir Walter Raleigh's man can do more than he. So he's just like a conjurer and trickster that Moses made the Jews to travel uh, 40 years in the wilderness, which journey might have been done in less than one year ere they came to the promised land to the intent that those who were privy to most of his subtleties might perish. And so an everlasting superstition remain in the hearts of the people. So he did it to like trick wow. all the Jews. So Marlo, this is Marlowe's beliefs. These are Marlowe's heretical beliefs about the Bible hmm. that the first beginning of religion was only to keep men in awe that it was an easy matter for Moses being brought up in all the arts of the Egyptians to abuse the Jews being a rude and gross people oh God. that, and this is the, uh, if you are listening with children, you might want to mute for just a sec that Christ was a bastard and his mother dishonest. Like, so it's just a list of these things that, that Christopher Marlowe Marlo believes. believes. And so he sort of like, it was sent to the Privy Council and to the Queen in 1593. And it was basically like, a, he's a heretic, get him out of here. Because at this point, the judgment, the, the, the government, especially the Queen's government, was all Protestant. So mm-hmm. anti-Catholic, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Protestant government. So being against God was very akin to being against the government. So Were he may things? have been an atheist. Right. Were those things true? This is someone's accusation, right? Okay, it gets weirder. Okay. So Marlowe was was born young, but may have been recruited. So were we all. Well, yeah, born young. We were all born young. Oh, sh- 
Yes. Well, a trilogy of three. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm okay with this. Um, he had a short adult life. He maybe was a government spy who was recruited while he was at Cambridge. So we, at, at some point at Cambridge, he sort of like went missing a lot more than would be okay by the rules of Cambridge. All of a sudden had a bunch of extra cash that seemed to come from nowhere. He may have tutored one of the Queens, like a niece of Mary Queen of Scots and James, the sixth of Scotland, who eventually became Edward the first. first. She was maybe a James the first James the first. No, James one. Yeah. yeah. He became James one of Scotland. And so he maybe was a spy on her because she was somewhere in the line for the throne and what? he was supposed to report. But she's, Cause she was Catholic. Yeah. What is that? Was Mary that the Queen complication? Scots is Catholic. Yeah. yeah. So he's like spying on this Catholic, maybe headed towards the throne thing and maybe supposed to report back. But he, at one point in the period that he was supposedly doing that, there's a record of him having gotten in a fight with one of his neighbors over something silly because they were poets and he didn't like them. And so he like went to jail for a little bit. But then he was also missing for two months in that time. So maybe, and then he tried to apply to a certain school and they said, well, maybe not. It seems like you might be into some stuff we're not into. And the government actually said, no, he was doing things that were important to matters of state. What? And he didn't actually intend to do these things that you think he was doing. And so there's all this like, what may have been a spy stuff. Uh, He's James Bond is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What? He was arrested in 1592, a year before his death, for counterfeiting coins, presumably related to activities of seditious Catholics. So Catholics that wanted to bring down the government. Right. He was minting coins with them. Um, but no charge or imprisonment oh, happened. Yeah, that's weird. You're saying that he did that to find out who those So he might, were. like, he, that, that accusation of coining, like, may have interrupted an in-progress right. operation to, to, like, figure out what was going on with seditious Catholics. So maybe he just puts on this persona of being, like, a heretic, be like, man, God sucks. And then all these other be- people be like, hey, I hear you think that God <laughs> sucks. And he's like, yeah, let's talk about it. Exactly. That. Like, he may, have, he may have been trying to ferret out oh. other atheists wow and he was maybe supposed to report back to the lord of the treasurer or lo- the lord of the treasury and that's why he was doing all the coining stuff so he sold his soul wow um maybe to the government the yeah. funny thing is that the guy who accused him of coining was i think this guy who wrote the letter about him being an atheist oh there you go okay. but then marlo instantly turned around and was like no you're a counterfeiter and Uh-oh. so they're like throwing these accusations at each other and so he eventually goes to uh, they they like go and arrest a bunch of people on these accusations. One of them is named Sir Thomas Kidd, who was one of his contemporaries. And they also like, born young. <laughs> also, I will fight you. Um, he was born a kid. And they find in this guy's papers a three page heretical treatise like paper. And the guy's under torture. The guy's yeah. like, yeah, that belongs to Marlowe. Okay. Um. It got shuffled into my papers by accident. Ugh. And like kind of sells him down the river right. mm-hmm. and so they kind of tell him to report in in front of the privy council but the day he's supposed to report there's no council meeting and so like you have to come every day until we tell you not to so you know come back so do that and yeah. get in trouble and 10 days later he's dead oh he's gone and Wait, there's who's dead marlo oh, okay marlo's toast And there's a lot of rumors about how this happened. One rumor is that he was having a fight with another like lowly serving man that was interested in his woman and they were fighting over the same girl. And so Marlo was following him to a party, pulled out his dagger, tried to stab the guy and the guy saw him, turned around and then stabbed him in like in the brain and killed him. Okay. There's another story that goes like he was sitting with two guys and they had spent all day in this bar or just sort of a house where they had to buy things. And at the end, they had an argument about the bill. And so Marlo got mad and pulled this guy's dagger and tried to stab him. The guy turned it around, stabbed him in the eyeball. And so Marlo instantly died. That's so there, there, there's some consensus around, but like eyeball stabbing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, okay. Gotcha. But the thing is, is like, head, yes. that was a coroner's report that mm-hmm. came out a while later and like put to rest all the conjecture of, okay, so this is what actually happened, but it's, sus- in the eye. but it's suspicious because yeah. apparently a wound with that size dagger in the eye would not instantly kill you. It would okay. scramble your brains, but you would live through it. And he didn't. Hmm. 
and there was no uh, local county fact check on that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I feel like being yeah. stabbed in the eye will yeah. do it. I don't yeah. know, but there was no local county coroner to go with the Queen's coroner to do this investigation, and so it would have invalidated the investigation. So maybe it was a cooked up story and not actually true about him and these two guys. So there are a lot of theories about this is like how Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, it is. this feels like you're <laughs> letting so you get like the weird. red, the red, uh, red wire between all the different pictures. Like, yeah, what is, yeah. what's going he, on, AJ? <laughs> so both of those dudes that he was supposedly hanging out with. One was a habitual liar uh-huh. and the may other was been, an alien. May have also been a spy, and the other guy was a con man. And so who basically said, like, I will lie and lie and lie and lie as long as it keeps me out of jail. So we don't know what happened. He okay. may have been killed, like assassinated by a jealous widow because he maybe was also gay. Um what? it's hinted at in a couple of his plays. The the evidence seemed really thready to me, but that's one of the theories. Um, he may have been that's killed by academics theory mm. by atheist Sir Walter Raleigh, who was afraid mm. of of like being outed as as this seditionist. And then there's a bunch of members of the Privy, Privy Council that may have been atheists that may be also arranged for his death. He may have faked his own death mm. to get out of his like coining problem and to not get captured and give away secrets of the crown or whatever it was. Or and then maybe wrote some of Shakespeare's plays. That's one of the theories. Yes. I don't see. I don't see how that could happen. Judging by his quality of literature and Shakespeare's quality of literature, it's night and day. It's not even close. Um, Did Marlowe write anything else? Yeah, he wrote. A, he wrote a bunch of plays. Okay. That's the thing. Is before his death in in ninety three, he had written a ton of stuff. And Shakespeare would go on to become more right. famous. But Faustus is his most famous. Work. Faustus is his most his most famous. And like when he died, there were a bunch of people that basically said, "Good riddance, God gets his revenge on atheists." And this was during the same period when plays and the theater in general was being raked over the coals by Protestants for being a place where like they worshipped deities because there were greek plays and stuff and so it was it was idolatry and even if they were doing biblical plays it was bad and so dr faustus may have been an excuse to put stuff up on the stage that was kind of fun and then at the end say yes but also be moral and like put the hands on the hips and have it be a morality Mm. tale so dr faustus a medium quality play (laughs) that was maybe written to pander to people who wanted to bring down the theater by a spy slash a counterfeiter slash maybe gay man Uh slash like, I don't know what was going on with this guy may have been an atheist. Maybe not. Who knows? And that's, so does this bring any color to the play and the character of Dr. Faustus and Mephistopheles as you now understand this person? Totally. I mean, if, well, I guess the question is, is Faustus is the play then a bit of a like honey trap, as well for atheists and people would be like, Hey man, I really like what Faustus said about screwing like how the Bible sucks. Let's talk about it. You know, like, is it, is or, it also like something to flesh out if he is sort of spying on her- to get heretics or something? Or right. was it that, uh, Faustus reflects Marlowe's own faith mm-hmm. journey, basically saying like the good angel only pops up once or twice and sends these little messages while like, Mephistopheles is at his arm always. Right. And the devils sort of usher him into hell with, very little fanfare from heaven. Like the plight of man is a desperate one and the devils are all around us when the angels barely speak to us. And maybe that's what he was feeling. And maybe you were supposed to feel that the humanist perspective is right. And there are little hints Mm -hmm. about earth being hell. And if this is earth, if this is hell, then it's not so bad and I will gladly be damned here. Mm -hmm. Right. So what do you guys think? Yeah. Or the doubt or if he says like, uh, if at the beginning he reads it and he's like, well, we're going to sin anyway. And if we're going to sin, we're going to die. Well, I might as well go for it then. Um, that That is sort of the, you know, obviously the soul that stopped, that hasn't, but that doesn't believe in the, that the goodness of God or the other, the other side of the coin is not believed or is not internalized or whatever. Um, but it does sort of, yeah. Now it's like, well, what, what is the play for? Um, yeah, on its surface, it's originally like an easy morality tale, right? Just it's a warning against don't do wizardry, right? Or selling your soul more generally. If he has the seven deadly sins come in, you know, it's avoid these, right? Mm-hmm. But if he was a spy, like you just note, noted that he sold his own soul. Mm-hmm. If he was a spy, might it also be like a don't sell your soul to the authority because could be like he feels like maybe he sold his own soul, and that's maybe. the thing is once you become a spy. Th- you are even maybe suspicious to your own government because you're involved in all these things that like, was he actually an atheist that they just used to ferret out other atheists or was he faking it the whole time? 
is it a wink nudge to the people to say like we all know all the fun is with the people that don't believe in the structures of Christianity. And right? the Pope looks foolish. The Pope's, in the play. A do- Pope's a dork. And like, but I guess they were kind of anti Catholic at that that's point. That's true. But it's like, is he sort of doing like a wink nudge saying like the real, the real sort of, because you're right, this is sort of at the, uh, you know, the Reformation has happened. Things are kind of like the, you know, the, the intellectual or the like educated man is the one that's like, well, obviously the superstitions of the past are dumb. Uh, and we're moving beyond such trifles. Like, yeah. that is in vogue at the time and that's that sort of the aristocratic leaning. And so is he kind of doing those sort of wink nudges to that, but can't really get away with it, so he's got to put a little morality tale at the end. Um, it's like like back when Hollywood had censorship, or had like uh, uh, the ratings board carried more power, and you, if you wanted to do something salacious, you couldn't, so you had to like... I'm just thinking of like, um, like shoot, you had to say Lucy in the sky with diamonds instead of, instead of I do LSD that or, um, uh, um, um, what's that cat on a hot tin roof? Oh. Like I watched that movie recently. I was like, I'm like, man, how did this get made in the fifties? It's just like, it's talking about, you know, a lot, um, sort of more, um, salacious things and like, it's a wonderful life or whatever, right. or other movies that were made in the fifties. Yeah. And so he, he kind of gets to bring Helen up on stage and do yeah, terrible yeah. things with her and have the, oh. the comedic relief be really body, but it's all under this guise of immorality tale, right? Yeah. Either guys immorality tale or in, it, this sort of sounds like the, the Will Ferrell comedy of its day, right? Like there's like the gross out comedy, but it's also got this little, um, um, like social commentary edge to it by saying like, wouldn't it be great if we could all just like throw off the shackles of morality and just like, and like really go for it. But it's still keeping the Christian ending or, you know, still keeping the, like the, the moral. expected moral ending or whatever. The other yep. fun question for me, sorry, were you gonna say something? Just, he didn't pick a very sympathetic protagonist. If he's trying to set up Faustus as him, I don't know. You're right. So, Especially because the guy looks foolish. Yes. And again, sells his soul to the devil. I don't know. It, and it doesn't get out of it. Or maybe that's how he felt about himself. I, it just doesn't. If he's trying to put himself in the play, it seems like he could have made himself more sympathetic. Yeah. The, Good. Well, I, I was going to take a new direction. Well, so I was kind of too, like, it means that Marlowe is an unreliable author. Like, you don't know why he's doing this. Um, because I mean, he's at the duplicitous end of it, at his core. Yeah, yeah he's duplicitous yep. at his core, and it's coming across in the story because it's like, here's all the fun you can have with the devil, but it's not really fun because you get dragged to hell in the end, but it's, it's kind of fun. <laughs> um, and, and you don't really know where to land on this thing, so at the end of it, you're like, well, is that just like dumb schlock, or is he trying to make a point, or is he just making the point poorly? Or is he just trying to make a buck, or is the whole exactly. play just to to draw in people who want to converse about atheism. Yeah. Right. Is, is the whole play just a, just a smoke screen for some sort of government thing that he's doing. Whereas, uh, you know, pick another work of literature that you would maybe consider to be higher than this. And you get, you get the sense that the author is doing things in good faith to the reader that when Shakespeare writes King Lear, he's wanting us to contemplate what it means to grow old and lose the plot of our lives. Whereas we don't know if Marlowe's writing this in good faith. Yeah, that duplicity is sort of off-putting and, um, um, yeah, makes you sort of like... I feel like if you got into... If you, yeah, if you took an interpretation of this story and you're like, what Marlowe's clearly saying is this you are have a high potential of Marlowe being like, bah, gotcha, you, you know, moron. <laughs> Whereas right. if you did that with Shakespeare, it's like, no, you just haven't got it yet. Like, if you're wrong in that, it's like, no, that, that wasn't exactly, like, push it further. I'm, I'm saying something more important. Whereas with this, it, it just sort of feels like a, you're, like you're the joke when you read that, if you like it. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, totally. And, yeah. and you, you even get that feeling reading the next one, Goethe, mm-hmm. Goethe's version, one scene in that has, I, I feel like, more to say and say clearly than the entire play of this one. Yeah. Right? At the end of it, I'm not really sure about anything, except that it's a very, it's seemingly a very simple message yeah, that's like, kind of stupid. 
that it, then and is sort of undercut by the rest of the play it sounds like uh, yes because i mean all the fun is people who are fiddling with that magic book yeah right and so then if you're like a fanboy of this if you like read this and you're like oh this is so good i love this like the joke's on you <laughs> maybe and and that's the other or fun that's the thing question. is like yeah. why is this why are we still reading this i'm wondering if the cult of personality has a bit to do with it right Marlo is so interesting as a character himself and so shrouded in mystery. Mm-hmm. Like I, there's a lot we just don't know about his life. All, most of that's coming from weird documents and side things and mm-hmm. letters that were circulated and people publishing stuff about like, I'm thank heavens he was stabbed by a servant, like that kind of thing. So that stinks. It, it might seem like I, I didn't really give you much, but there's, there's really not much to give. There's mm-hmm. a lot of conjecture about his life. Do you know anything about the folklore from where it comes or anything like that? I mean, I mean like, that letter was published and given to the crown, but the crown did defend him earlier saying that he was working for them. No, I meant the folklore of Faustus. Faustus. Oh, Faustus. I don't know much about okay. the Faustus folklore, but I do know that like reading Goethe's, you do get the impression that he is working in good faith, mm-hmm. that he mm-hmm. is actually saying something important about poeticism and about the soul and about desperation that comes at the end of, at the end of academia. Like I, I have already put stuff in my commonplace book from Goethe's version that I like this version didn't touch any of my commonplace. Then do you mm. think then that is a necessary element for a great piece of literature is that the author is doing it in good faith as opposed to we, as uh, the motivations are hard to understand. Is he just trying to make money? Is he just trying to like sell this sort of body story? Um, I think it depends on, is he just trying to like stick it to the church? Uh, I think it depends on what outcome you're looking for. To me, this is interesting as an as an author piece of work combo, right? I'm interested in it. Will I take any greater meaning from it for the rest of my life? Absolutely not. Uh, it's, so then what's the, what's interesting then if it's ephemeral for you? Uh, like these that? very questions we're talking about mm-hmm. right now, like what do you do with an unreliable narrator? How, how has the cult of personality drawn this work forward as something we continually reference? Is it simply because Faust and Mephistopheles became touch points for selling your soul to the devil and a, a devil as an, you know, an example devil character. Mm -hmm. Um, Is, is that why we draw it forward? It's kind of like movies that had become famous, even though they weren't really that good in the first place Hmm. for some side thing that they did. But for that one side thing that, that popular culture took and ran with like i can't think of like a snakes on a plane there's one like one good line in that movie the movie was (laughs) ill-conceived it was poorly shot it wasn't very good Mm -hmm. samuel l jackson said one thing that Mm -hmm. we've all run with and that movie should have died Mm -hmm. to posterity and it hasn't because of that one line and was the the movie made in bad faith the movie made uh, you know exactly what it's going for it's Mm -hmm. for kicks yeah right yeah so then, but but snakes on a plane doesn't set itself up as being uh, high important. literature. Important. I'm Do not you sure get the this sense does either. That this is okay. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, to me, this seems like a Saturday evening random entertainment play. Yeah. Um, it does not. It does not feel like the grandiose stuff that Shakespeare is putting forward in pieces of his. And there, there's some Shakespeare plays that feel like Saturday evening entertainment too. Sure. Midsummer Night's Dream comes to mind. Mm-hmm weren't most of them consumed that way that going mm-hmm. to the globe theater was not some like high and um, high ref- art. Yeah. yeah. Refined experience. It's, you know, people um, crowded in people throwing, I food. don't know. In the beginning it wasn't later. Shakespeare was patronized by the King himself. Sure. So at that point you have to consider it pretty fancy. Yeah. But at some point it's commoners it, 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 like this is the movie of the day is to go and see a play. And right. so, yeah, not, not every, not, because something is old doesn't mean it's refined necessarily. Sure. But, I don't know. It's an interesting comparison to your um, biography episode, your fall of Rome episode. Cause like everything that makes this play interesting is the life of Marlowe. Yeah. As opposed to it standing on its own. If I'm understanding this correctly. That's, well, yes. So, I mean that that's maybe one of my own personal, not pet peeves, but things is I, I just don't like porting the author's biography into the story. Right. Um, I agree. I think that this piece kind of fails as itself. Yeah. Maybe I'm just not deep enough and I'm not understanding all of the nuance to it, mm-hmm. but I've, I've, I've just read better. Mm-hmm. It's still so funny to me that you, you still picked it, I guess, because you want to go into Goethe's Faust, right? I, if I had read this and then read Goethe's Faust and it was just as bad, uh-huh. I would maybe think <laughs> find something else. This is good to maybe do an episode saying like, don't bother. Yeah. But 
it's also funny because it's such a culturally important idea, right? The doc, the idea of Dr. Faustus. It's right. Then funny to see that the original play isn't mind blowing. Yeah, it's just not. Yeah. Was it something like, um, everybody kind of knew the story and, and he, so he was doing his own version of it. It's like, oh, here's new, another Spider-Man. I don't know. Movie. Maybe it was popular, but I'm, maybe I'm just picky now. Yeah. Like maybe it's, maybe other people would be like, oh, this is great. But I'm just in comparison with Shakespeare, there's mm-hmm. no piece of this that really leaps out to me. And there are pieces that don't make any sense. Like the, the seven deadly sins. Why do we waste time with that? It's important. Kinda, except everybody knew it already. Probably. I don't know. Anyway, that's it. That's it for me. I like it. All right. This has been Classical Stuff You Should Know. You can find us online at patreon.com slash classical stuff. You can find us on YouTube, on Twitter, on email at the guys at classical stuff.net. And we'd love to hear from you all. So thank you all for listening, and we will see you all next week. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye.